In recent years, true BMW aficionados have been going through some really trying times. Sometimes they see front-wheel drive cars, other times minivans. Then they see huge electric things, giant grills, massive cars, even the Hofmeister kink goes missing. And then this. Still, despite all the nightmares, one can still dream. I am Guille Garcia Alfonsi. This is Power Art, powered by Total Energies. And today we're going to have not one, but two goes at the new BMW 2 Series Coupe with the rear wheel drive 220i and the wild M240i X Drive. BMW obviously needs to make those cars that their passionate supporters don't like. Creating that type of product allows them to access other areas of luxury that change the world we live in. Nowadays, lifestyle cars are interesting more buyers who prioritize aesthetic, comfort and appearance over dynamic performance. That's why it makes sense that there are these cars that fervent BMW fans don't really care for. It's also a way to innovate and avoid coming to a standstill. When a brand stops moving forward and does the same old, same old, everyone zooms past them and things go sideways business-wise. So if BMW wants to keep selling 2 million cars worldwide every year, they have to get into other, previously untapped areas of the market. That's why things like the iX, the XM, the new 7 or the i4 make sense. But as we told you in the Z4 video, the company also promised us it would stay true to the brand's original DNA. And that is the creation of a three-box car with a longitudinal front mid-engine, passenger and driver here in the middle, the meaty bits in the middle, rear-wheel drive, a car that's distinctly sporty, but at the same time versatile enough to be used every day. Which is what BMW has basically been doing since its 9 Series, the 2002. The small 3 Series cars in the first generations applied to a current car. A real BMW, which we will look at later to see if it scores the maximum of 50 out of 50 for weight distribution. The new BMW 2 Series Coupe is all that and it's also a mission statement. BMW has moved its compact range to the front platform to create volume, where customers interested in this type of car don't ask for it, but at the same time, they made the wise decision to put a lot of money into having this car on its modular rear-wheel drive platform. A car that has a lot in common with BMW's own Z4 or the Toyota Supra. And a car that is not just for marketing purposes or to meet enthusiasts' expectations. In its previous generations, this car was selling 35,000 cars a year in the European market. So, there really is an amount of demand that justifies the existence of the 2 Series rear-wheel drive coupe. Of course, if you compare it to the compact cars of the 1 Series in general, which has a sales rate of 100,000 cars a year, you might think it's small potatoes. At the same time, you have to look at the Alfa Romeo Giulia, which sells fewer than 10,000 cars a year in Europe, to realize that the 2 Series Coupe is doing really well. Despite all the fuss that has been made about the aesthetics of this car, I'm going to say that I like it. However, we do have to recognize that all BMW fans would probably like to see the rear-drive 2 Series Coupe with different aesthetics. We would each have our own design and our own approach, but when you see this car firsthand, at least in my experience, you see that the front suits the rear. You see that it flows in general, and that it represents everything you expect from a BMW aiming to be modern, distancing itself from that neo-retro design that some might might have liked to see.
let's start by looking back. When I tested the M240i on the channel years ago, I told you that I found it lacking in aesthetic muscle, especially at the rear. It could be a bit more aggressive, but only the M2 got that treatment. They perhaps overdid it with the elegance that covered up the sporty aura of the car for an onlooker like me, who's quite the badass, as you know. In fact, I distinctly remember telling you that it drove me crazy that to have the aesthetics of the M2, you had to go for the price of an M2. Well, here the approach has changed completely. With a super wide product range that already includes an elegant option, with the huge 4 Series Coupe that has shifted to the attitude and position of the 2 Series Coupe passenger car from the last generation. The new car, whose external design was led by Jose Casas, was now able to take a lot more risks, be more aggressive, and become sportier. Casas and company started with an ideal sketch of a completely retro design inspired by the 2002 with round headlamps and lights, a large front scoop, and two triangles on the sides. A beautiful concept, which we talked about months ago with Paul at the Posh Tape, flawed by the fact that it wasn't modern. And BMW doesn't want to make retro cars, it wants to make modern cars. So some ideas and inspirations were taken from the sketches, but the bulk of the car had to be different. BMW wanted to create a modern, technical car that was current. And they achieved this by introducing a lot of technical lines, a lot of body, wide sides, very elaborate surfaces. These aspects erase the elegance of the 2 Series Coupe of the previous generation, but it give it greater presence. And if you think about it, the 4 Series Coupe is for those who are looking for a smoother, more elegant, more traditional car. This one leads more towards the badass side. You can see it in even the color of the car itself, which suits me a lot, by the way. Special attention is paid to all the elements to create the feeling of a short, compact muscle car. This car is 4.5 meters long, so it's not as compact as BMW would like it to be, but Casas and company have pulled out all the stops. First of all, they have created a repertoire of sentimental references. So we have the muscular squared off sides inspired by the M3 E30. The main lights are single headlamps, which according to their designer are reminiscent of the look of the 2002, but at the same time are technical and contemporary, wrapping around with the signature lights for visibility. The mirrors on the M240i use a two support design that calls back to those on the M3 E36. The bonnet is raised and has a bit of the E92 in it, while also serving to visually shorten the car from the side view. There's a Hoffmeister kink, which was missing in the 4 Series, and tail lamps that are reminiscent of the 2 Series coupe of previous generations. Then there's an elongated main grille that extends towards the sides. The fact that the headlamps are drilled onto the front surface and tucked away frees up space for this slim, three-dimensionally framed grille which is also slanted to reflect the ground, reminiscent of BMW's shark nose of the 70s and 80s. The grille has slats that open and close for cooling, and underneath is a fully functional air intake framed in a V that was normally only used for M versions. But for some time, it has been used here on the M Sport on cars with M finishings. It's been placed right here between these two fangs. Then we have functional triangular air intakes on the sides of this car. In a minute, when we look at the differences between the four cylinder and the six cylinder, we're going to see that on the other car, they're just for decoration. The side view is a work of art of lights, reflections, and tension lines. It all starts with a waistline, a line created by the shoulder that starts at the front headlamp goes along the waist, slanting upwards, to then form part of the rear light, which we will see later on. This line is also drawn with a slight curvature that gives the car some life and reminds us a lot of cars that have used this style line, which actually wasn't present in the 3 or 4 series, but is used here. There's a second parallel line halfway up the body to reflect even more ground, to give a little bit more muscle here. Another thing they've done, which looks really great, is generate body for the front sides. If you look here, it generates a kind of triangle that launches and hugs the front tire. Then we have a super muscular rear wheel arch to give it some presence here as well. What strikes me the most is that all of this is achieved without the car being exceptionally wide. 
When you look at it from above, you see that this part is more or less in line with this part, more or less in line with this part. But they play with light, reflections and shadows to create that body that we missed in the last generation. There's a small vertical line behind the front wheel arch for aerodynamic purposes, to cut the airflow, and a running board in a contrasting color. The roof arch is pure BMW E46. The flush door handles, borrowed from the 4 Series Grand Coupe, provide a cleaner side view that, in my opinion, is stunning. There's been a lot of controversy regarding the rear, but I don't get it. I suppose that looking at the catalog photos, the rear might seem a bit strange, a little low or something like that, but in real life, it doesn't give you that feeling at all. Everything starts here, progressing from what is the side shoulder to the rear. This creates this chamfer that we see here that also highlights the width of the rear wheel arch and makes the car look wide. Then a diagonal line cuts across the waistline that starts at the front, as you can see here, arriving here and creating this cut at the tail lamp. We also have a chamfer in this direction. Adding a chamfer like this plus a chamfer like this creates a very wide sharp at the rear and adds this line to the framework. And since the tail lamp goes all the way to the edge, that leaves this part, this separation that gives the car even more body, makes it feel even more like a car with wide sides, like for example when you see an M2 from the previous generation. This whole framework runs along here creating the ducktail on the traditional BMW rear boot, which is always higher than the front bonnet. Then as I said, the headlamps. The tail lamps are superbly crafted in three dimensions. We have this vertical cut to make the car as wide as possible. We have the shoulder line that goes over the tail lamp. We have that continuity that I just mentioned going down here. Then we have this horizontal line which opens the space for the number plate. There's another curious element inside the tail lamps, and it is that Jose Casas, like we saw at the beginning of this aesthetic section, in those sketches, had thought of using round tail lamps as a nod to the 2002 Ti. Since he couldn't do them, because, as I said before, they're not going to make neo-retro designs, what he has done is create here a polygon inside, which is the brake light framed by this tail lamp in 3D. This reminds us of that round tail lamp that is so cool and sporty too. The bumper is huge and has retro reflectors positioned vertically on the sides to give the car even more presence and width. There's an integrated diffuser housing the framework for the exhaust tailpipe. These are polygonal on the M240i and round on the 220i. I'm not here to tell you if you like the car or not. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and tastes are very personal. But I have to say that I think it provides exactly what BMW was looking for by using all those references to past cars of the brand, including the purple color taken from the E36, to create a car that stands out, has presence, and that will certainly help its sales. Again, it is worth seeing in person before forming a final opinion because there are differences with respect to the others. But in any case, tell us in the comments if you think it's a cool car or not. Inside, the car has large front seats. It has the same dashboard as the 4 Series, so you can imagine that the width is that of a 4 Series. That's normal because a lot of this modular platform is taken from that 4 Series, which is a much bigger car. You've got plenty of room for everything. A quasi-perfect driving position, the M steering wheel, which I still think is too thick, levers fixed behind the steering wheel, very ergonomic like the 4 Series, climate control with physical buttons as always, the volume is a physical button, the super wonderful iDrive controller to control the infotainment system. In addition to being a touchscreen, this screen can connect with Android and everything else. The only thing about this car that hasn't won me over is the fact that the instrument panel doesn't have the graphics you would expect in an M because it's not an M2, which is a big rev counter in the middle. The gauges are weird. If you have the rev counter on the outside of the speedometer too, that makes controlling the revs not the most intuitive thing in the world. The gear engaged is displayed very tiny down here on the right, and although it has a data projector on top, and that does have a rev counter like a race car, and it helps. When you're driving fast, when you're in sports car mode, your focal point is so far in the distance, so focused on the horizon, you look so far away that you just don't see the heads-up display. You don't see it. You can't make it out. Differences between this car, which is the M240, and the 220i. 
Finishes, materials, fittings, it's all identical, but the seats here are M seats, which are the same as we saw, for example, in the 4 Series, in the 3 Series, and they were made with great attention to detail. The 220i seats are a little more slippery. They have a separate headrest and lack that sporty flair. I definitely like these seats better, but enough to pay over 20,000 euros more for just this car's seats? No, the difference is in the power. This car is still practical. It has two adult seats behind the front seats, with decent space lengthwise and across, although a little limited in terms of height. If you're going to use these seats often, you'll want to buy a 4 Series Coupe. As for compact C-segment cars, I can tell you that the back seat of the Golf R is 5 centimeters deeper, 5 centimeters wider, and 10 centimeters taller. However, the rear seats have independent climate control with adjustable air vents and two USB-C ports. The workmanship, both in the front and rear seats, is far beyond what you normally find in the C segment in terms of materials, settings, the feel of the plastic parts, the lighting details. Everything makes you feel like you're sitting in a more expensive car. The boot at 390 liters is sufficient, with a lower load opening than the previous model and regular shapes. All that said, would it work as your only car? If you don't have children at home, yes, definitely. If you have a family, small children, this works as a second car, in my opinion. Unless your children are old enough to get in the back alone and you don't have to break your back to buckle them in. Of course, in that case, if they are on the tall side, they will have a hard time in the back because of the height clearance. The 2 Series Coupe is built on the Klar platform, which is BMW's modular platform for assembling rear-wheel drive and all-wheel drive cars. It's the same platform used in the 3 Series, in the i4, in the 4 Series Grand Coupe, in the 5 Series. They play with these components, with these Lego pieces, to create different models. With the 1 Series having gone to front-wheel drive for all its derivatives, this 2 Series has to borrow from that set of new parts, which is a completely new platform for the 2 Series Coupe, because it was previously based based on an earlier version. So what they have done is directly take the front axle of the 4 Series Coupe, the rear axle of the 4 Series Coupe, and a lot of its components, assemble them on a shorter body, and this car is the result. Specifically, this car has 5 centimeters more in front track width and 3 centimeters more in rear track width. It's much wider, and it's also 5 centimeters longer in the wheelbase, which gives us a little bit more occupiable space. Overall, the car is 11 centimeters longer, and the roof is 3 centimeters lower. So the end result is that the car looks looks wider, longer, but also lower. It looks sportier, and in theory, it should also be better dynamically because of that. Torsional rigidity is 12% greater. This also translates into an increase in weight, but more torsional rigidity allows you to release more springs and shock absorbers, play better with the suspension, and more precision without twisting the body. In particular, the weight of this 220i, which is the version we can compare, because before not all versions of the M240 came with all-wheel drive, blah, blah, blah. The weight has increased compared to the previous version by 80 kilos. 80 kilos is quite a lot, but if we take into account that it's 11 centimeters meters bigger, well, that's normal. It's a heavy car. We'll see how its kilos are distributed, but the homologation weight is around 1,565 kilos for 185 horsepower, 184 to be exact. It's not the eighth world wonder, given the trend that we're seeing right now of heavy cars. What are you going to do? More specifics that we want to see. We're going to look at the suspension now, which is what's cool. In terms of suspension, all these elements... Let me just leave the script over here. We've seen all these elements previously in the 4 Series, in the 3 Series, and everything else. That is, we have a McPherson strut, like every BMW rear-wheel drive car ever, a forged aluminum strut axle, arms, two arms broken down to form a lower triangle, also made of forged aluminum. If you look at the diagonal, it's what bears the longitudinal movements. That's why it has a pretty big bushing there, which is also filled with hydraulic fluid to make a more comfortable car. The transverse has a bushing that is much smaller in diameter because it's much stiffer. It's less flexible, so the car moves more precisely. On top of that is the suspension strut, in this case passive damping for this 220i, with different shock absorber settings depending depending on the wheel position. When it's in the middle, it has a soft ride. When it's compressed or extended to the extreme, it becomes harder, because it has a kind of hydraulic buffer, let's say. 
We already talked about it in the 4 Series Coupe. This makes for a more comfortable car while also giving body movement control. However, its performance is also a bit peculiar. We'll discuss later when we're driving how the wheel falls fast to enter the corner and then stays like that, which is cool. In this particular unit, we have brakes with the M Sport version, which are four piston calipers on a floating disc that's smaller in diameter than the one we're going to see later in the M240. Rims are also optional. Here, Pirelli P0 tires have been used. I'm not really sold on how they ride. These tires don't have the best grip. Later, we'll see that the other car is a bit off in this sense. If we go to the rear suspension, we have a multi-link system, five arms, all of which are made of stamped steel plate. We see over here, one, two, three, and at the rear, we have this mega arm, also made of stamped steel plate, and this fifth element. We have a plate that aerodynamically covers this rear part. The stub axle is made of forged aluminum. And then we have a conventional differential hanging from the metal structure that makes up the rear subframe. How does the M240 differ from this car? Well, we're going to see right now. For a start, we obviously have two more cylinders. We have more kilos. Later, we'll see that this car is clearly heavier. The fact that it has two more cylinders up front is going to make the nose heavier as well. But in terms of suspension, you can see that it is identical with only two exceptions. On the one hand, we have a drive shaft because this is an all-wheel drive car. On the other hand, we have a cable in the shock absorber and it has a cable because it is a variable pitch shock absorber. Here, we don't have that shock absorber that is more or less rigid depending on the position. Instead, this shock absorber has an active valve that changes the shock absorber setting depending on the movement of the wheel or the driving program that we're using. On this car, the four-piston caliper is over there. It looks bigger than the other car. To me, they look the same on the outside. Maybe I'm wrong. We have a disc, which is, yes, this one is clearly bigger, steel disc, aluminum drum, and Pilot Sport 4S tires. They perform great. They're tires that I like a lot because they grip well on dry terrain. They grip well on wet terrain. They're relatively quiet, and above all, they're very consistent. They work very well when cold, when hot, when you still have a lot of rubber, and when the tire is in the last 10% of its life. This is nice because it makes the tire more predictable. What else? Well, back here, you have the same five element suspension that we saw at the front, but we have an M Sport differential with electronic locking. What this does is it closes some friction discs that it has inside, and what it's going to do is give the car that rear differential lock that we're looking for, but controlled electronically, so it can decide how much lock you have at any given moment. The other big difference compared to the other car, compared to the 220i, is that this car is all-wheel drive. It's all-wheel drive, or rather, it's rear-wheel drive with a front axle that can be engaged. It engages through that transmission shaft that you see there, which engages through a clutch that's tucked inside this housing. Normally, the car sends all the torque to the rear axle, so it's rear-wheel drive. But when you lose drive in the rear, it locks up this little clutch in here. And as it's squeezed, it sends more torque to the front wheels, so the car is able to pull from the front and go. We'll talk about this performance when we're driving, but to me, it's very reminiscent of the Nissan GTR when you're drifting, and then it starts to drive forward, in a kind of odd way. The next part of our analysis of the car at Neumaticos Valleros, with the help of Martin and Jaime in this case, was to weigh both cars to find out the actual weight and weight distribution. Results. The 220i did very well, weighing in on the scales at 1,520 kilos. This isn't a light car, but the weight is equally distributed among the four wheels. This is one of the greatest demonstrations of engineering I have seen in modern cars in recent times. The M240i paid for its all-wheel drive system with its two extra cylinders on the front axle. This brought the weight to 1,700 kilos, or 180 kilos more than the 220i, which we'll see later on will affect the car, especially on the front axle during corner entry. The weight distribution is also shifted to 54% of the weight at the front and 46% at the rear, although the lateral weight distribution is still very well controlled. In terms of geometry, BMW continues to avoid extremes. Although they announced in the press release that this car had 40 extra minutes of camber at the front axle, both cars have less than 1 degree of camber on the front and 1.5 degrees of camber on the real axle, so not extreme at all. For good measure, the front-end geometry has over 7 degrees of caster. Very generous. 
while at Towin, both units were very slightly open at the front end at 0.5 degrees, thus favoring corner entry initiation. The rear was set at 0 degrees of tow-in on the M240, while the 220i was set at 0.5 degrees of tow-in. To make sense of these numbers, to explain them, I'll say that to solve what I'm going to tell you about the dynamics of the car, you would have to get a little more aggressive with it. Get aggressive with the front end with a little more camber. Give the front axle a little more tow-in. But the price of doing that would be destroying your tires faster and making the car more skittish at high speeds. These aspects seem incompatible with BMW's idea of making this type of large passenger car. These units we have here come at two completely different price points. We have the 220i with four cylinders, two liter petrol, direct injection, aluminum alloy block and cylinder head, a very familiar BMW engine with twin scroll turbocharger and variable valve lift and timing. This engine here delivers 184 horsepower at maximum output between 5,000 and 6,500 revolutions per minute with a maximum torque of 300 newton meters available from 1,350 to 4,000 revolutions. The M240i is no joke. We have here a 3-liter, all-aluminium, twin-scroll turbocharged inline six-cylinder engine, block closed at the top around the raised cylinder liner, and variable valve timing, liquid-to-air intake heat exchanger, the same heart we saw in the 340 we tested some time ago on the channel. This version offers 374 horsepower between 5,500 and 6,500 revs per minute with 500 newton meters of maximum torque available from 1,900 to 5,000 revs per minute, sending the torque through the all-wheel drive system that I've already explained to you when we were under the car. The M240 is fast, very fast against the clock. We managed to do the 60 to 100 in 1.9 seconds and the 80 to 120 in 2.6 seconds. To put it in perspective, it is faster than the first 370 horsepower M2. And compared to the competition we tested in the mega comparison three years ago here at Power Art, it is 0.3 seconds slower in the 80 to 120, although in the 60 to 100 it practically ties. From a standstill, it does 0 to 60 in 4 seconds flat, which is 0.3 seconds quicker than the M2 competition we tested. It uses its all-wheel drive to achieve this. The mileage from a standing start is promised to be 22.5 seconds, but we could not confirm this number. Basically, the M240i X-Drive against the clock is a car worthy of the M it bears. The 220i, on the other hand, with half the power and 200 kilos less, offers more conventional numbers. It goes 60 to 100 in 4.2 seconds and 80 to 120 in 4.8 seconds. I think this surpasses expectations for this level of power and allows you to easily maneuver the car when overtaking, handling steep slopes, or whatever comes your way. This car, the 2 Series Coupe, was born to be the ultimate expression of what a traditional BMW sports car should be, what we all have in mind when we think of a BMW. And to achieve that, it has to be more than a machine you enjoy driving. It can't just be a car that says, you want to take me for a spin? It also has to be a bit versatile, be all-purpose for any time, in any circumstances, on any kind of road. And BMW has nailed it. Compared to the previous generation, this car is quiet, more comfortable, has a better interior setup with a better sound system and improved suspension. In the 220i, we have the now famous shock absorbers with hydraulic compression and extension stops that BMW has used in its models since the 3 Series. And here, once again, I'm sold. They're a bit strange. I told you before when we tested the 4 Series with this type of shock absorber that my first impression driving in cities was how comfortable that car was for being a BMW with a sporty feel. I thought I was going to destroy this car in the open road, but that did not happen. Here we have that ability to absorb, that ability to handle potholes, that ability to maneuver when the shock absorber hasn't moved much. But then when you enter a corner, it drops down onto its support quickly and once it's stuck in, stays there like a more rigid shock absorber. I think it's an ingenious system. The only circumstance when it can make things difficult is if you hit a big bump on a hard support. When you already have the shock absorber in its rigid position because you already have the car supported, if you hit a very big bump, the shock absorber is very hard and it won't release like an active shock absorber or one with a frequency sensing valve, like the Olin's DFV. DFV were they called? In the case of the Konef SD, they still have that ability to soften up 
when it's time. The excess anti-dive in the previous two series is gone, so the car is more predictable on curvy roads when you turn. The change in the front end geometry also helps with this, as it's a bit more aggressive with 40 extra minutes of camber. But you've already seen that even so, the resulting camber is not excessive, and I would say it even falls short. But in any case, it's more direct, more immediate from the front end. With the active suspension fitted to this M240i, we lose that initial movement of the shock absorber, but we gain comfort. Thanks to the use of its piloted shock absorbers, the car is comfortable in comfort mode. And then, when you put it in sport mode, it's sportier than what you get with other shock absorbers. I have to say that it always feels a bit more grounded, but also, because you're more limited in your movements, it's harder to sense what the car is doing. In other words, because other shock absorbers have that initial movement until they find their support, which is very quick, they allow you to feel that support and allow you to have a better sense of what the car's doing. On the other hand, when you put active shock absorbers in comfort mode, they face springs and stabilizers that are relatively rigid. And that means that you lack a little bit of control when rebounding while extended which, in some types of expansion points, makes the car try a second time to rebound in extension when you hit some very special bumps. These are very subtle details, and I've been able to notice them basically because I have both cars at the same time. I've been able to ride one right after the other. The question we could ask ourselves might be, is the active suspension worth it? The answer is probably no, because the standard shock absorbers are very good for that combination of sportiness, performance, and comfort. Is this active suspension a little bit better? Probably, but I don't know if it's worth it. Well, I don't think it's worth the extra, really, unless you're going to go to the track. There, you can take advantage of that sportier, more sport plus tuning, and you can get better tire grip by making the car stiff as a board. As in other modern cars we've tested, the comfort driving mode lulls the engine and gearbox too much. And as with the A-Class or Golf, you'll find you have a response time of a second or so before the car starts to accelerate for overtaking. You have to accelerate hard to wake it back up. So getting out behind a car to overtake requires you to go all the way to the kickdown on the accelerator to wake up the machine inside the car. I know this is done to lower fuel consumption and for a relaxed driving experience, but it can be unnerving and you end up setting an individual mode just to avoid this. The driver assistance systems are great. They let you relax when you're driving because they help you maintain your speed and everything else, so very good for that. We didn't get the automatic lane centering system on either of the two cars, but it would also come in handy when it comes to long journeys on motorways, which are a marvelous experience in this car. We took it on a five-hour trip in one go, and it was a piece of cake. The infotainment system now also has the integrated wireless Android system. Everything is then projected onto the instrument panel on the data projector, which has wonderful resolution and is a good size. It all adds up to a very pleasant environment for long journeys. The optional Harman Kardon sound system in the two units we borrowed is also fantastic. And then we have to talk about consumption, as far as this type of use is concerned. With the M240, you can get around 8.5 liters per 100 kilometers at a good pace on the motorway and highway. You can save 2 liters per 100 with the 220i's four-cylinder. The 230i is probably around the same fuel consumption figures as the 220i. So, if you can afford to spend the 2 euros, more than 2 euros, the almost 4 euros more per 100 kilometers that this car is going to cost you compared to the four-cylinder, you have to think about it. If you can afford it, the good thing is that you have the six-cylinder, which sounds better than the four-cylinder engine, but you have to remember that this is cumulative economic damage. In any case, in either car, considering the features they have and their amazing engine, especially the M240, I find it amazing that they get this fuel consumption. We're used to BMW making wonderful engines. It's a pity that we're going to have to say goodbye to these petrol engines in Europe.
The sound level in both units, despite the different tires, which in theory should be worse for the M240i, is a tie at 67 decibels. This is a very good number, especially when compared to the noise made by a Mercedes-Benz A-Class or CLA or a Golf. But at this point, what you're probably wondering is whether this car drifts. Can it be driven sideways? Is it a real BMW and all that? We can't do that. We can't show that on the open road. So once again, we have gone to Apastoriza in Lugo to the PTC learning track to see what this thing can do. Both the M240 and the 220i. Let's get to it. So we're going to talk about the track now, and we're going to start with the M240i. You might think it looks a lot like the M2 that we brought here to a Pastoriza some time ago in the mega comparison of sports cars that cost around 70,000 euros. And I mean, the power, the punch, the sound of the engine, it has those touches that make it similar, but at the same time, it's a completely different car. I'm going to start by talking about the car with the stability controls on. Let's turn them on, in fact. With the stability controls on, it's a super easy car to drive fast. And it corrects a lot. So it's going to stop anything from happening to you, no matter how much speed. Pedal to the metal, here coming out of the corner supported, it's not going to want to skid. All it's going to do is push when the steering wheel is neutral and the car is stable. You're also going to feel the support of an all-wheel drive, the support when it comes to getting the horsepower down, the 300-odd horsepower, 370. This power ends up finding its way out through all four wheels, and that makes for a lot of forward momentum. What are the downsides to the car in this type of driving? Basically, the first example I'm going to give is the gearbox system. It's very quick to engage gears like a dual clutch when engaging, but in downshifts, its speed and response are a bit lacking when making a downshift. Here I go, braking very hard. I brake, and it's not the same as taking off in a dual clutch like in the M2. It's difficult, and there's a small delay. Chassis balance and all that? You have to remove the stability control to notice it. Let's take it off here. Now you have a mode called traction, which loosens up the rear. You'll see that now. And lets me go on the accelerator and drift a little bit. Let's go to the long corner to see it exactly. But you still have the safety net of the ST being there to prevent you from having any spinning problems. See? Look, I can drift here. But the ST puts the car in position for me. You don't have to catch the car quickly with the steering wheel. It makes you feel like a driver. I can control the brakes. I can put the car in position. I can make those quick lefts and rights. I exit the corner with power. And all this is very easy. It's fun. But the good thing is that it's easy. It's easy for a car with so much power, so much punch, 
rear-wheel drive. It makes you feel like a driver, but it still has those little tugs from the ST that put the car in position, that interrupt you, and especially if you're trying to control the power input with your right foot to say how much horsepower you want at each stretch, you find that there's a little electronic interference there. So you hit the button again, here it's going to say, traction control is off, oh, I just dropped my keys. With the stability control completely removed, the car is still a nice ride and easy to drive. In my opinion, it's missing the front end that the M2 had. It's lacking steerability. It's not as easy for you to tell the front end what you want it to do. You have all the power you want in the rear wheels to pull out the car by pure power. The fact that it's an all-wheel drive does not prevent the car from drifting. It is self-locking. It helps you. You can drift if you want to drift, and you can use less power without a problem and play with the counter steering. Play with whatever you want. You can even use the brakes and finish the corners sideways. But you always have that little bit of interference from the power to the front wheels, which means that when you're really sliding the back end, when the car is very sideways, they start to send torque and you start to drive a little bit like the Nissan GTR. You start to drive from the front as well, and that makes the car go sideways, but at the same time, it goes forward, and that makes you lose a little bit of control of where you're headed. You could say that you run into a little more interference when it comes to steering. And then it's true that it isn't as aggressive as the M2. It lacks a little bit of camber, a little bit of toe out probably, to really be a car that you position with the steering wheel. That means that when you go sideways, you don't have the same precision with the line, with the front end that we had with the M2, for example. Does that make it a worse car? No. What it does is make us even more eager to see the M2 because the platform of this car is insane. Because although I'm talking about these complaints, I have to tell you that the car is amazing. The six cylinders is marvelous, it sounds beautiful. got all the kick you want. Brakes. Brakes in sport. We found them a bit lacking in terms of heat resistance on the track, but they have a very good bite. They're variable. And as for the steering, I will say that it doesn't transmit as much as I would like it to in terms of losing drive. It doesn't lighten up enough to let you know, but it's ultra precise. I like the tuning reaction it has, and it's also very predictable when it comes to knowing how much you have to turn the wheel every time you counter steer. When you say, okay, now I have to go like this, and it's there. Conclusion, power skidding when exiting a corner is easy. Going sideways all the time, from corner entry to corner exit with this X-Drive system, it's a lot more work on your part at the wheel, and it also requires you to get the hang of the car because it demands to be driven in a certain way. I can understand why the Pure M's have opted for a button 
to disengage the front axle drive when you're trying to do this. Still, this car would also need to change the front axle settings a bit to fine-tune the behavior in these circumstances. And on the other hand, you would have to play a lot more with the tire pressures, as we always play with the pressure recommended by the manufacturer. In this particular case, we had to lower the pressure to at least 0.2 or 0.4 bar. I'm sure the M will fix the few mistakes I see in track driving, but the matter I'm going to address now is, on the track, maybe the 220i is a better option, because here you notice the kilos. I have to tell you that as well, because ultimately, the front end, all this that I'm telling you, that I miss the ability to send the car just where I want it to go, also has to do with the kilos that you have hanging over the front axle, the six cylinder that's hanging over the front axle. The extra 200 kilos means that you have that extra inertia that makes the car want to open up in the corners. You have a little bit more inertia with more kilos. In the end, no matter how much you hide the kilos and no matter how well the car drives, and the car drives really well, you can't make that weight disappear. And I assume that I could get more out of the four-cylinder in that sense, with less weight, with only the rear-wheel drive system. Now, we're going to test that hypothesis by changing this car for the 220i. You get in the 220i and immediately you feel the car is lighter. The front end is much more immediate, much easier to get into corners, and this one has Pirelli P0 tires, which grip far less than the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S that the M240 has. But taking away the kilos the other has on the front changes things radically. The fact that you don't have any traction on the front, it also changes the way you can get the car out using the accelerator. The only circumstance that can limit the fun here is the lack of power. Who would want, I, I mean, who wouldn't want the power and punch of the M240's rear end with this front end? In the end, in a way, that's what the M2 ends up offering, I think. Although the M2 does weigh like the M240, or will easily weigh like the M240, Important issues here. Without the stability control on, with everything set to sport mode, the car is totally easy to drive. Predictable. It's not going to do anything strange. You can do whatever you want with it. I can turn the steering wheel incorrectly and it's not going to drift in the back because your guardian angel is there. If I did what I'm doing here without stability control, I'd be spinning, but the brake corrects themselves and stabilize. It's no fun, obviously, but the good thing is, no matter how much of a novice you are, you can enjoy the car's punch knowing that Mr. BMW is going to be looking out for you. Traction mode. You remove part of the traction control so you can start counter steering. It's the second level. You've learned to drive the car properly, more or less, and now you can use the gas and do a little bit of drifting. Just a little bit. It doesn't have all the punch of the other engine, and obviously you can feel that. We're going to wait for a round corner to see. There we're going to try to drift, but you're going to see that it's not able to maintain a long drift because it lacks power. It ends up finding the drive and ends up stabilizing. However, it has that little layer of fun rear-wheel drive. It's a bit like the GR86, I'd say. The GR86 has more power even. In this car, it has a little bit more torque. It ends up feeling better. Let's see, accelerate here to a drift? Nope, the control didn't want us to do it. Let's turn it all off. DSC off. Second. Let's play a bit more here now. Now it's completely loose. You can play here with inertia entering the corner. You hit the accelerator and go sideways a little bit. It's fun. It's agile. It goes into the corner better than the M240, as I said, but it lacks a lot of power. The brakes are practically the same, but powerful. Carrying less weight means that they can withstand the heat a little better. At least it seemed that way to us. It's also true that this car is a little slower, has less weight, has less power. You arrive slower, and ultimately the brakes also appreciate that. The tires, as I said, have a lower grip limit, but that also makes it easier to get in and out of the grip zone, and you can play with more precision when it comes to control. 
I like this car a little bit more because of just that. You can play more with the front end. It's more assertive. You can put the nose where you want it because you can feel that you don't have those 200 kilos, part of which is 100 kilos extra on the engine, that you don't have that around the front end. And that makes the steering, well, a little bit better. Let's say that the M240 is a bit like, I'm not going to say Audi because it's not. Audi is more weight and the nose. But it has that extra bit that ultimately conditions you and gives you extra power. Yes, you start with much more power than with this car by pure acceleration. It's more fun because of that, but that extra weight you're carrying also conditions you if you want to enter a corner hard. It limits the situation a little. The solution for the track perhaps lies in the 230, which is precisely the unit we haven't ordered, which we'll have to test because with 245 horsepower, it'll be more capable of maintaining a drift than this car, which only has 184 horsepower. At the same time, it's still four cylinders. I assume that it won't have as much of a problem with the weight as in the case of the M240. Things I don't like about this car, about the 220i, one is identical to the issue with the M240, which is the reaction time of the ZF Torque Converter automatic gearbox. The gears enter really well, but again, on the track, it doesn't like downshifts. Sometimes it shifted up a gear without our asking for it. Then here, I tell it to go to second, and it takes a while to react. And that sometimes leaves you a little short compared to a dual clutch or a manual gearbox where you can play with the clutch. I like it in general. I don't think the gearbox is a problem, but it's true that compared to a manual, you lose that. I don't like the feel of the accelerator either. I didn't like it in the M240 either. You have the kickdown. That conditions it a bit down below when you go pedal to the metal. You have to overcome that kickdown. That final touch of the accelerator, that's a hindrance. And in both cars, both in the M240 and in this 220, you have a certain degree of turbo lag that I've normally noticed in BMW engines in street driving. But here, it's true that when you're on a fine line in the drifts and you want to go on and off the accelerator to your liking to finish the line in the drift, you're a bit helpless because you don't have that millimetric precision that you had in a naturally aspirated engine like the V8 of the M3 E92. There, whatever you opened with the accelerator knobs with your foot was exactly what you got at the rear wheels. Here, you have a certain degree of delay, which could be improved. I'm being very picky. This car is amazing. What do you want me to say? So to sum it up quickly, what I like on the track would be the M240i's punch with the lighter, more compliant front end of the 220i. And that's despite the fact that the 220i still lacks a bit more immediate bite from the front end. The passive shock absorption of the 220i makes you read a bit better where the kilos and force are, while the M240i needs to go harder and does so because the kilos and power, but at the cost of losing some of the pure feeling. As I said a moment ago, I am now interested in trying the 230i, which has the weight of the 220i and a bit more punch without all-wheel drive. But what I'm really looking forward to is trying the M2, where BMW has already shown in the past that it knows how to give it all for the car to have a more immediate turn on the front axle and make the accelerator more instantaneous. Returning to the open road, I will say that the front axle is also more aggressive than in the previous generation, and you can really tell. It's a car that's more eager to go into corners without being a Ford-style car. It still doesn't have as nice a front end as I would like. I'll just straight up say that I would like a car with the front end of the last generation M2. But BMW, for some reason, always keeps that immediacy when going for the turns. And these cars hold back a bit so that they don't enter the corner so urgently when you turn the steering wheel. There must be a reason for that, I guess. Okay. 
one might wonder why BMW, which knows how to make cars more specifically for steering requirements, still subdues them on all but the purest M vehicles. But perhaps this has to do with the target customer profile, with the idea of calming the car, especially for use on long motorway stretches at very high speed, where you may find yourself needing to dodge. It's in those fast, high-speed changes of direction, typical on German autobahns, when there's a car in your way, that you need to have a car that's direct in the front, but at the same time is calm, so that it doesn't get too bold on its own. Or maybe BMW simply doesn't want to make driving the car that complicated for you, unless it's a run-of-the-mill M. The funny thing is that the M240i might have some complaints in track conditions, but then you go to the open road and all those little complaints that I'm telling you about literally disappear from the face of the earth. Here, you're not going to get the full power, the full lateral grip available, and the fact that you have this six-cylinder sound, this thrust, and the feel they've achieved with this car really make it a machine you really enjoy driving on a curvy road despite its extra kilos. Here, I don't care so much about the front end. I don't rely so heavily on the front end that I need to hang the car on corner entry. And that means you get to enjoy the car in a different way. Here, you get better marks for dynamic handling and fun on the open road than you might get on the track. Whereas the M2 is probably the answer to finding that ultimate score. But if you're spending more time on winding, curvy roads and all that, you don't have to go for the M2 if the M240 is enough for you. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's actually more fun than the previous generation in this kind of circumstances. This car is a base. As a starting point, I think it's just great. I love its aesthetics, I love its technical concept, and I love what BMW is trying to do and keep alive. A lot of manufacturers want to come off as sport car manufacturers, but you really have to have a two-door coupe of this type in your range if you want us enthusiasts to believe it. I'll go further. They might tell us there's no market, but if the car is capable of selling 35,000 units a year, there is a market still there. In fact, depending on the version, these cars have a long waiting list if you start shopping. That being said, of the two we've tested, I'm not yet sure which is the perfect polished version that I would buy. They have fixed the problems of the 240i from the last generation that we tested right on this same road a few years ago. I remember telling you that that car's aesthetics were very flat. But now you have the body in the side view. You don't need to go to the M2 for that. So good for BMW. And they've also put in a more aggressive front end, which goes into the corners a little bit better, something that is becoming a transversal sign with BMW because in this generation of models, they're attacking the front end cars a little bit more. However, they both have their drawbacks that don't work perfectly for me. Let's start with the M240i, and I'll tell you that there, the use of the X-Drive system, which wasn't previously obligatory in the 240i, muddles the performance a little when you go crazy sideways on the track, I should say, because you shouldn't go like that on the road. The fact that it drives on the front wheels in the end makes it difficult to get it on a clean line from the entry to the exit of the corner going sideways. It's the same thing that happens to the Nissan GTR. The same thing can happen with any car that has this drive system. Obviously, it improves the drivability a lot and is a huge plus for users of these cars who encounter snow, rain, or similar situations with so much torque and so much power. But I'm left with the problem of not finding a pure rear-wheel drive version, or at least a button to switch off the front-wheel drive system when you want to go crazy. However, if you're not going to do that and you're going to drive at 80 to 90 or even 100% of the grip limit but on public roads, in those conditions, I don't think you're going to have that much of a problem. The other drawbacks I found have to do with something the two cars share. I would like them to have more front-end bite, if anything, a little bit more camber, a change in the ratio of front to rear anti-roll bar spring rate, because it's still not dominated by the front end. It still shows a little bit more understeer than I would like. It still doesn't have the front end, basically, of a Julia, or I would even say the current 4 Series still bites a little bit better than this car. The feel of the accelerator is sometimes a bit faint, and sometimes a bit disconnected from exactly what you'd want when you're not driving in the sportiest of modes. 
Even in those circumstances, when you're on and off the accelerator to modulate the rear end, the drift you get, it doesn't go quite as smoothly as the cars did when they were naturally aspirated. Maybe that's just impossible to recover, at least until we go to electric engines. As for the 220i, the complaint is, a bit of a platitude, that it lacks the punch to round off the exit of corners. I liked it because it weighs 200 kilos more. The weight is better distributed and you can flow more and better on corner entry than in the M240, but I'm missing the final punch, the final kick to be able, once you've displaced it on entry, to exit with power and round the corner. Maybe the key solution would be to buy the 230i, which is precisely the version we haven't ordered and at this rate we'll have to try it. So that's what I'm thinking, maybe the 230i and the M2, which won't have the X-Drive system, as far as I know, will at least be able to disconnect the whole thing. Maybe they are the two key parts in this 2 Series rear-wheel drive coupe. These two cars are not exactly cheap in our market. The 220i costs 43,150 euros, while the M240i goes for 70,000, 69,900 euros to be exact. The 230i comes in at 46,650 euros. If you look at the market, the 128ti, also from BMW with front wheel drive, costs 46,550 euros. I mean, it's the same as the 230i rear wheel drive. And here, there's no comparison. If you can afford the 230i and do without the rear doors, buy the 230i. The same thing goes if you're looking at a Golf GTI, a Cooper Leon, or any other conventional GTI, I would never hesitate to go for the BMW rear-wheel drive model. A Mercedes-Benz CLA 35 AMG is around 70,000 euros and does not come close to the driving experience you get with the M240i. It's a hell of a thing that I'm basically recommending the 230i, which is precisely the 2 Series Coupe that we haven't tested. What I do think is important to say is that if you're looking for an aspirational compact for 40,000 euros, that's not the kind of money we spend on aspirational compacts nowadays. That money is going to give you enough to buy an A3 with 200 horsepower, a Mercedes A-Class or a 200 horsepower CLA and the 220i that you have back there. And the question is, which one would you buy, Guillet? Or which one would you recommend? The 220i without a doubt, unless you have to use the rear seats enough to justify having five doors. Any other reason or question you can ask is going to lead you to buy the BMW, which is better than either of those two cars without any doubt whatsoever. And now to conclude this video, what we're going to do is reflect a little. Why would I buy it? If I didn't need the back seat so much? Because I have two children, yes. As a second car, I would buy it too, but of course, in that case, you have to have quite a pocketbook to have a primary car and then have the chunk of change to buy one of these. Like I said, I would probably recommend the 230i. I have to try it before I can recommend it. I have to digress here to remind you that this is probably the last time we will see BMW launch a pure petrol non-hybrid two-door rear-wheel drive car at this weight. After this car, what we're going to see are electric cars, and we will have to see if they're capable of copying this wild, fun, and enjoyable performance, which is nearing extinction more and more each day in the car market. For all of you who asked me if you should buy a new 2 Series rather than a used car from the last generation, all the new versions of this car are clearly better than the previous ones. In the rear-wheel drive basics, it is definitely better, because the front end has been improved. In the main versions, 240 versus 240, the pity is that you have to buy this one with the X-Drive. But in spite of that, I like the car more. Not just for aesthetics, the quietness, the drive, the comfort, but for the mere fact that it enters corners better. And to those of you who have asked me if this car, the M240, is better than the original M2, the one with 370 horsepower before the competition and everything else, no way. The M2 is better. It's as simple as that. It's better because the front end is better, and you have a better command of what the car is doing on its four wheels than in this M240. We're now looking forward to testing the new M2, which I imagine will be out before the end of the year. So maybe next year we can take it to a Pastoriza. And as I told you earlier, we'll probably end up testing a 230i. I don't know if it'll be in comparison with another car to ultimately decide if that's the 2 Series Coupe with rear-wheel drive to buy right now. To wrap up, this is everything we wanted to tell you about these cars, and there was quite a bit of information. If you have any questions about the rear-wheel drive coupe series, leave it in the comments. If you liked the video, please give us a like. If you have something to say about the aesthetic of the cars, we would also love to read that debate in the comments. We'll be back soon with another video on another car. Bye!
Hey, remember, you can show off your love for power art with the glasses, hats, t-shirts, and jumpers that Kimoa designed for us. Available at www.kimoa.com.